Well, I don't know about you, but my lungs are sore watching Kate uh, just go to town on the flute. So thank you. That was incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a moment where I was like, I wonder if I could hold my breath that long. Um, that was cool. I'm really excited uh, to talk about Table to Table as we talked about earlier with you, but I want you to know that we believe the genesis of a story matters. Um, two years ago, the Lord spoke that over me uh, consistently in every conversation I found myself in. Uh, when I was upset with people, the genesis of this anger matters. When I was happy about something, the genesis of this joy matters. When I was confused, the genesis of this confusion matters. And if we're not a people who look back and remember why we feel something, why we believe something, why we want something, then we will become a very blind leading the blind-esque if we don't remember why. And so the genesis of a story matters. And today we're going to look at the genesis of why we believe table to table is a thing. But before we do that, I also just have realized that marriage makes me look at the genesis of my story in a way I've never looked at it before. Right? Yeah, yeah. Pray to, right? Uh, question for you. Who remembers their first year of marriage vividly? Like very, very clearly, Right? Oh, I'm living in it. Celebrated three months, I believe. Yeah, three months. Um, I, I know. I don't just believe. <laughs> Confident in that. Um, two days ago, and my, what I'm realizing is this statement keeps coming out of my mouth. Why am I like this? <laughs> why, why do I feel a certain way about something and other people feel a certain way about something else? Um, and not in an argumentative way, just like little things. Uh, first example I have for you, the utensil drawer in our kitchen, right? <laughs> Some of you guys are like, I already know where he's going, right? When I grew up, my utensil drawer, right? For some reason, I don't know why, it was butter knives on the left, and you, that was a miscellaneous butter knife. And then they didn't all have to match those little like butter knives only for the holidays. You can put those there. They're safe there, right? And then it was big spoons, because you got to have two different sized spoons, and I didn't know the importance of that until I realized I like eating ice cream with a bigger spoon. Uh, <laughs> makes me feel less bad, you know? <laughs> little spoons, Big forks, little forks. And every once in a while, there's like a miscellaneous tray. Sometimes you get like a kid's spoon in there or some just utensil, a spork, right? right? Maybe that's where that goes. I don't know. That was what I remember. Well, my household now, when I open the utensil drawer, it is uh, butter knives in the same spot. We're, we're good with that, right? And then forks, right? And I'm like, oh. I can deal with it. I can figure it out. And then little forks and then spoons and spoons. And actually some spoons are above and beyond. And, and now we even have a space just for straws, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, and, and I, I'm not going to lie. The first time I opened the drawer, I wasn't like, I wasn't like mad, but I was like, hmm, why? <laughs> like what, ra what, what were you raised in that I was raised in differently that just has a different space for spoons. It's not a big deal at all, but there's something about that, right? This is like, wow, there is the genesis of a story matters, I guess. Um, another funny thing, toilet paper, right? Um, front, back, right? Does it roll over the front, over the back? Um, this has become wide topic of debate in the office even. And somebody told me this, somebody told me this, they said that beards are cool and mullets are not. So... That's how you can understand the right and the wrong way. And I'm not going to lie, when I was single, I don't think I had a method. I think, <laughs> I think it was whatever way that it was put on there. Um, but now that I'm married, it's in the front. Um, so we know that. We know that. But why, right? You, you ask the question of like, why do I feel like this needs to be a certain way? Or why do I have emotional ties to the way something is done? Um, and not in, in, in a negative way at all. Just, I think that question is actually really important. I think it's really important for what we do here too. And the genesis of a story matters. Um, I uh, cannot tell you how many times when people have an issue with something or they, they question God, I say, read Genesis. Because the character of God, although we see an Old Testament God that seems to be different, let me tell you, the intention of our God 
is good from the beginning, from the get-go, from the start, from the Genesis, right? Uh, But we have to ask ourselves why we do anything the way we do it in church. Because if the only reason you do something is because people did it before, that's the only reason. Why do I put the spoons there? Because my mom put the spoons there. Is there a purpose behind putting the spoons there? No. (laughs) If all that you do is just because other people did it, then reformation is allowed, right? You're allowed to reform that. You're allowed to transform your thought process about why you do something. But there's other things that I don't think you have to negotiate because there's purpose in the tradition of it. We know that. There's purpose in the tradition of why you do something a certain way. We're going to get into some details about that in in Hebrews today. But ultimately today, for, for our sake, we're going to ask that question regarding table to table. What was the genesis of table to table? Let me tell you a couple things. One, Um, I was offered a new position at the church to to help with the establishment of discipleship and to help with missions from a local scale. Do I help with international stuff too? Yeah, but local mission is where my heart is. Um, Now, from an international mission standpoint, we we still do international missions and we want to create more avenues for even other people to step in and lead that to an even more extreme. We we plan on that being the case. But from this perspective, the, the question was, what do we do with discipleship at the church? And when I came in and I analyzed what we do for discipleship, I didn't want to say we did anything wrong. I just wanted to say that what we did was incomplete, that there's more that we can step into. And the reason why is because our eggs were still all in the basket of Sunday. The Sunday was the gathering space. The Sunday was the space of instruction. It was the space of connection. It was the space of commission. It was the space where you came together with people. And that's the end all be all of a lot of people's relationship. And I'm not here to demonize our way of doing things. I'm telling you that the American church as a whole found something with Sunday school. They thought this was good. And I believe it was. I also believe that we are stepping into a space and in a time where we can question and ask, what more can we do? And so that more is what I'm here to talk about and to reiterate with table to table. Because table to table is a way of saying, hey, Sunday mornings are not the entire cake. It's not the whole pie. Rather, it is the icing on top. And for too often, too many years, too many decades, many people have been treating the gathering that you're sitting in right now as the entire pie that it is the end-all, be-all of our formative relationship with the Lord. Now, we have separate time by ourselves, too, that this spurs, but for the most part, we come here, we gather, we receive, and then we go. And there's nothing wrong with that model as long as it's not the whole pie. Because if it's the whole pie, let me tell you what we give birth to. We create consumers of Christianity, not disciples of Christ. That's the difference. If this is the end-all, be-all of your faith, then you come in and you say, what can I consume so that I have enough of it to take me on until I consume again? That is not the spirituality that Christ calls us into, yet I think we will dive even deeper into why I believe that's not true. Instead, I'd rather this be a space of part of the disciple building process. And so that's what we have with Table to Table, is we celebrate this space as the first table that you sit at. It is a four-table model, actually, um, that we go. We, we call, I'll breeze through this quickly. Um, and if you want more information, find me. I'll talk with you about this. I'd love to. But we like to separate how we connect, how we grow, and how we learn into four separate tables of gathering. The first table of gathering is the table of community, and all of you guys are participating in that table right now. Corporate worship has been important to the tradition of the church forever. You will see corporate worship on all scales of church history. You'll never see a time where there's not corporate worship or the desire to have corporate worship. So I'm here to tell you, this is a good thing. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. Once again, not the whole pie, right? Uh, If you can have a scriptural reference to why you're in this room, the best I can give you is um, the feeding of the 5,000. What do 5,000 people do in that day? All of them fix their eyes on the same God and say, that is Jireh. He is my provider. He is given. He is here. And he is worthy of our praise. All of you guys get to do that right here in this space. 
But there's more to it. 5,000 people all together don't just connect with one another, right? There's a deeper form of relationship that Christ wants with us. And he doesn't want to just be a display, of, a display of something for you. He wants to actually talk with you. And that's where the next table comes in, the table of connection. The table of connection is unique because all of you guys probably already sit at a table that functions just the same as the table of connection. What we mean by that is a space where there's common ground between you and the people sitting at it. For me, on Mondays, I sit at the table of connection with a group of guys who golf. And we play nine holes. After the nine holes, we get some food. And after we eat food, we have a little devotional. And then we go home. And the beautiful thing is, when I play golf with somebody, and when I eat a meal with them, and when I have a devotional with them, I learn their name, I learn about their children, I learn about what their passions are, I learn about what their desires are. I know more about that person because I sit at that table with them. And I'm not challenging this space, but how many people's stories do you hear on a given Sunday when you're not, when just in the service time? Not a lot, right? You hear maybe more of my story or Pastor Doug or Pastor Don's story than anybody else's, but there's a deeper connection by the people that are sitting to your left and right that we believe is important. And Jesus did too. He finds himself on the shoreline so often in the gospels. Why? Because he values the table of connection. He puts the sea behind him for two purposes. One, to block people from being behind him. He wants to be able to look at everybody in the eyes. Two, Because there's great acoustics in having the ocean behind you. You can talk to more people. And you know what they can do? They can ask a question. And so Jesus at the shoreline welcomes people to say, hey, who are you really? What does it mean that you did this on the Sabbath? Why did you heal this person? Why did you hang out with tax collectors? Those are the questions asked on the shoreline. And those are the tables, the the questions you get to ask at the table of connection What's your name? What do you do for a living? What makes you excited? What's something the Lord's revealing to you? Those are questions that we want to take place in spaces of worship. They don't happen corporately, but they do happen connectionally. And so the table of connection is a space we want you to find. Some of you guys are already doing it. Your table's just not purposed yet. The next table, um, honestly, springboards right off of connection. It's the table of commission. And the commissioning table is is just what it sounds like. It's a space where we realize there's something greater than us. And the only way to step into something greater than us is with others who believe, know, trust, understand, and challenge us to be greater than we are. And that was what Jesus did for the disciples. He sits at a table intimately with these 12. He knows them well. And if you want to get really deep, he knows three of them more than anybody else. And he challenges them and he says, you have the ability to be the rock through which the church can grow. Go. You are the one whom I love. So share that love with others. You are the one who understands the intricacies of my kingdom. So go and share. And so when he talks with John, Luke, and Peter, that is the relationship that we see. And many of you guys have people that are that close to you. That when you fall, they catch. Or they hit the ground with you. When you cry, they cry with you. When they walk uh, forward, you are either, they're either behind you or they're in front of you and they're guiding you and helping you. We desire for that relationship to have Christ at the center for the transformation of who we are. That's the table of commission. And then lastly, we joke about it, but I also think it's just very important, the coffee table. (laughs) How often in a month do you make a regular uh, appearance to have coffee with a friend just to catch up? And it sounds so simple, but I did it twice this week. And it's been a couple weeks since I've been able to, honestly. And I don't think, I think when I booked the appointment with my friend and said, let's hang, I thought, oh, this will be good, but I'm really busy. By the time the coffee was gone and the cup was empty, I am so grateful that I made the time for it. And very often we are neglecting that time because of the busyness of other schedules. The table-to-table model will call us not to neglect that time. And Jesus sits one-on-one with so many of his disciples to tell them a word that he couldn't tell them communally, right? And so why tables, you might be asking? what's, What's the purpose? Well, the genesis of this story leads back to this too. I asked myself the question, um, 
where did Jesus spend his time? And if I look in the gospel, if, if our spirituality is linked to this space, which is most closely related to the temple, what about Jesus? How often does he spend his time in the temple? Um, I can tell you this, it's not even close to as many verses as the amount of times we see him at the table. Uh, I'll give you a quick just run through of the gospel of Luke. Um, I missed instances. There's probably like 10 more instances of him at the table, but this is just a couple going through the gospel of Luke in order. Uh, Luke, the first miracle that we see happen, Jesus is performing, uh, he turns water into wine at a wedding feast while people are gathered around tables because their witness would come from a table that he was Messiah and that he was Lord, that he was a God that was different than the other gods. He wanted them to witness it at a feast, at a table. Luke 5, uh, he meets with some tax collectors at their home and reclines at their table. That's the verbiage we hear, reclines at their table. So understand that the table even invites a posture to it. That you, you don't, you're not supposed to be tense at the table of the Lord. You're supposed to recline, relax, chill out. Something that's very often hard to do in a hustle and bustle culture when we have an agenda and a schedule to follow a routine, right? He reclines at the table with tax collectors, one of whom would eventually become one of his beloved disciples. Uh, Luke 7, we see him at a Pharisee's house. A Pharisee finds him in public and says, I invite you over for dinner. Uh, the rest of the public is going to be very concerned with this man claiming to be the Messiah going into a Pharisee's house. But he doesn't care. Why? Because the table is a space of transformation. And he sits at it with him. Luke 11, we see another Pharisee say, hey, it worked for that guy. I'm going to invite him too. And that's weird. That's, that's cool, though. That's how the table-to-table -table model works. Wait, they are doing something stupendous at their table. Let me invite someone to mine. Something important to that. Luke 12, uh, Jesus starts talking, and he says that the people, the people who are awake to the message of God will recline at the table, that they won't be tense if they're awoken to the message of God. They will recline. They will rest in the presence of God's truth. Luke 13, he speaks to a group of people and he says, when you enter the kingdom of heaven, you will recline at the table. And so you know what reclining at the table does for us today? It creates the opportunity for us to understand more of what eternity looks like. That if you can recline at the table on earth, you'll be prepared to recline at the table in eternity. Luke 14, he invites these guests to his house because it's Sabbath, and he just decides to share stories all day. If we can't receive in the temple, you will receive some stories and some transformation at my table. Luke 17 is a parable of a man, and this parable is so wild to the culture that he's speaking to. Why? Because he says that there's a man who allows a servant, a master who allows servants to recline at his table. And Jesus poses the question to his disciples, do you know a master who allows a servant a space at the table? To which none of them can answer that they do. And to which Jesus can reply, that is the God in whom you serve, a master who invites you to his table. In Luke 24, we know, right before he's betrayed and arrested, crucified and killed. He has those who love him dearly sit at a table in the upper room as he breaks bread and drinks wine with them and tells them to remember this table setting because it will transform the rest of their lives if they remember it. The table's important, and we want to believe that here too. And so we step into volume two Volume two of Table to Table. Every six months, this is our plan. We want to check in. I told you before, it's hard to hold adults accountable to church or to growing in their relationship with God. When I was a youth director, it was really easy. I would just say, hey, what are you doing? Where have you been? Why are you posting dumb things on Instagram, right? That's what I can say. If I said that to any of you, why did you say that thing on Facebook? You could be like, I'm never going to listen to this guy's teaching ever again, right? <laughs> And so I don't want to do that, and you don't want to do that. So what I get to do gracefully, and we all get to do gracefully with each other, is say this, how many tables have you sat at over the last six months? Have you found yourself at all of them? Have you found yourself at just one of them? Did you open your life up to maybe connecting at one that you weren't connecting at before? And if you haven't, 
We're here to tell you that we are a people who believe in reforming and transforming models that we created. I believe the genesis of table to table is good. And so it will stay and we will build off of it because the genesis is purposed and the genesis of it is good. And that's what we're gonna get to do next week. We're gonna create some new opportunities, some new connectional opportunities we wanna invite you out to. You'll have to stay tuned. If you can remember an episode of your favorite TV show, that to-be-continued slide at the very end, that's where we're at right now. Next week, something cool is happening. We want you to be there and to connect with it. But we're excited because we know the Lord's gonna build on what he's been already starting. Uh, I tell everybody, I believe the, the thing that we did in forming Table to Table is we created the outside of a puzzle. And what I did at that point is I said, hey, the outside of the puzzle is drawn for you. I've got to go get married. I've got a lot of crazy things to do. And I've got 10 weddings in three months that I'm going to attend. So you guys run with it, right? And that's not a lie at all. I wish it was. (laughs) And so we said, we're going to put this in, in the hands of our congregation. And a lot of you guys sprinted with it. And a lot of you guys have, have reached out to me and said, hey, I haven't connected too well. And, and we want you to know that we know that was going to happen with some. And our hope is to come alongside you, put a couple new pieces in, and say, let's run again. And then six months from now, we'll enter volume three, and we'll enter a no- couple new pieces, and we will see this puzzle unfold every single day, and we'll add to it every single day as well. Uh, before I get into the details uh, of some cool things scripturally that I think the Lord wants to real, reveal to us in Table to Table, uh, as we give this recollection of what it's been, I wanted to invite one of my awesome friends, Cindy Saunders, up uh, to share with you her experience at the table and to maybe challenge you from her testimony of what it's been for her. So if you guys would, would you welcome up Cindy? Cindy. Thank you, Mac. My name is Cindy Saunders. I'm the lay leader of this church, and I also lead the Searcher's Sunday School class at 930s downstairs in the social hall. I have a lot of connections here at this church, and when Mac first posed this idea of table to table, I thought, well, that's nice. I hope everybody else really gets into it, and they get it done, and that kind of stuff, because, you know, I'm widowed, and I don't do a lot of things other than come to church and do some of those things, but I just don't know where this is going to fit for me. However, the more I thought about it, especially after he asked me if I would talk to you for a few minutes today, was, guess what? I've already been doing them. I just didn't know what to call them. I didn't know whether it was the table of connection or the table of commission. I just knew it was me and some other people getting together and doing some things. And the more I began to talk to other people about the things that they were doing, especially in the searcher's class, the more I began to find out that this isn't that difficult. This isn't that hard. What happens to most of us, especially people my age, and frankly, the age of our searcher's Sunday school class, is that when we think about gathering around a table, if I were to ask you, what's the first table that you remember where you really built connection. Many of you would say family, because when I was growing up, family actually ate dinner at the table. And on Sunday, we may have had company like other relatives in and had a really nice meal at the table. It's where we connected with our first friends and our first cousins and our parents. So understanding that you're gathering at a table isn't that, that difficult until you start thinking about all the things you're doing. One of the things that we find is there's different kinds of tables, even if you're going to gather around and have a meal together. There's the dinner table. A little over a week ago, the searchers had what we call, where I come from in Illinois, a potluck luncheon. Here I understand it's called a covered dish. But it's still food that tastes good that somebody made in a dish. And one of the things that we found out, that we find out every time we get together like that, although we sit around tables every Sunday in searcher's class, is that when we join together under different circumstances, not on a Sunday, where we can just be together with each other, we learn so many things about each other. We learn that people have things going on in their lives that they need help with or that they can help us with or that we can share with them. Sometimes we laugh and have a good time. Sometimes we cry and have a good time. Sometimes we do both. 
okay? But the connection that we make with each other is very special. I've literally had people tell me in that group, this is the first time anybody's ever prayed for me because we pray joys and concerns every single time we meet. And people will say, nobody's ever prayed for me before out loud by name. I find that so sad. So these connections that we're making at these tables are not that difficult to do. You just have to learn the different layers and levels and rephrase what you're already doing just a tiny bit. If you have two or three people together, you're having a table of connection. If you have maybe four or eight people together, you've got a table that's building in strength. Because I know people in small groups in this church who get together on a weekly basis and they make things or pack bags for the homeless. I know people who go out and scour the um, thrift shops and then get blankets and children's books and things like that to take, for example, to Faith Neighborhood. There's a group in our, where I live at Kings Ridge that gathers up food supplies and things to take to Hope to Restoration. So what I see around me is all of these people who are already doing all of these things just maybe don't know what to call it. The table of worship always comes to me after the table of family because in our church where I grew up, they had a table. There is one downstairs in the social hall that says this on it that says, in remembrance of me. And I bet in a lot of the churches you grew up in, that was your communion table also. And we always were called to the table to take communion. So a table can be a place of worship. I had a home Bible study during COVID. A lady said to me and some other friends, she said, I want to know more about the Bible. And we said, well, when COVID is over, Bible studies will start again. And she said, I don't want to go to a Bible study with a lot of people. I want to be with some people that can answer all my questions. Well, that was a different thing than sometimes the way we study Bibles. So if we just look for opportunities, we'll find all these layers and levels and these places that we can come together and do all of the things that our church is laying out for us. We just have to put a different label on it. So when you think about the next time you're going out to eat with friends, that's a table of connection. If you think about praying for the person who waits on you, that's commission. When you say to them and they say, can I get you something else? And you say, no, thank you, but can we pray for you today? You'd be amazed at the look on their faces. Maybe nobody's ever asked to pray for them ever in their whole life. I like to remind people that I know that you may be the only Bible that some people ever get to read. So make sure that you're putting it out there, that you're showing God's love. When you come to the table, Bring someone with you. When you feel too lonely to be at the table, find somebody to go to be at the table with. And all of these things will come together in all of these connections and the ways that, that Mac and our staff is talking about. We are a community even if there's two of us. We are connected even if there's only four of us. We are commissioned every time we offer the life of Jesus as an example to someone else. And by the way, I don't drink coffee, but I love the coffee table because some of my best friends and I get together and we talk about things that are just things that are going on in life that we need to talk about. And almost every single, well, let's say almost per, every single time, it comes out that we're well, that we're blessed, and that we're doing okay. We have tables like Celebrate Recovery and tables like our youth groups that meet. You can be at any of those tables. All you have to do is show up. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for sharing. Um, <clears throat> and the beautiful thing, too, is we're about to enter into a scripture that I can just tell you I am going to touch barely even the tip of the iceberg on. And if you have a table of connection and a space to meet with afterwards or before or, or later on in the week, there's a depth of relationship you can enter into with the Lord that I can't usher you into here. And, and it's okay for me to say that because I'm acknowledging that we need you for this place to thrive and to grow deeper than we can, than we can get it. So 
I want to enter into uh, Hebrews 9. I want to just share this scripture with you. It jumped out at me this week um, as I was reflecting on what I wanted to share, how I wanted to recap table to table. And I just realized that there is something new upon us, and new is good. And we know new is good because Jesus embraces new. And the writer of Hebrews, who we're not certain who it is, um, there's no definitive answer. Uh, Most people believe it's Paul. So if you want to think this is Paul's writing for the day, that's okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, But I think he's got something powerful to say about what we come to know as meeting with the Lord as he draws upon the old way in which we met with the Lord, the old way in which we entered into his presence. And so this is Hebrews 9, uh, verses 1 through 10, for you to read with me. Not even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. I'm sorry, I meant that I'll read it. But, um, for a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It was called a holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place having a golden altar of incense in the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim uh, of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things. We cannot now speak in detail. Why can't they speak it in detail? Because only the high priest could tell you what that looked like. And only the high priest could go in there once a year. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second, only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of all the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. Something important scripturally that we're seeing here, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with the food and drink and various washings regulations, and regulations for the body until the time of reformation. There's a lot of lofty words, a lot of crazy uh, things that we could exegete in this scripture. And exegete just means to dive deeper into the context, right? But ultimately what you need to see is that connecting with the Lord was difficult. And if you could picture it in a way, it was to say that there was a very small sliver in which barely anybody in this earth could enter. And if you wanted to, you better be sharp. And if you weren't sharp, If you were dull like all of us, you weren't going to make it. And so one person would go in, the high priest. On behalf of all of us, he would walk into the presence of the Lord, and he would take with him an offering for atonement. He would take with him an opportunity for our conscience to be cleared, but not perfectly, because he was an imperfect man. And I asked myself this question. What halts you from connecting with the Lord? I'll almost guarantee you it's your conscience. What's that thing that when you try and get deep into his presence, it just deeply stands in front of you? A thought, a memory, a heartache, a sin, something you struggle with right now, grief, guilt, shame, I don't know what it is, but it's different for all of us. And our conscience plays a role in our prayer life, in our connection with the Lord. And he knew it back in the day. And so they said, hey, we're going to take this blood offering in with us to cleanse you of your sins and to cleanse you of your consciousness. But not perfectly. You're still going to have to fight to worship. And so I need you to see this picture because in that tent, there's a table. And on that table is a sacrifice. And that table must be created to the dimensions in which the Lord has desired. Must be three feet tall. Must be two and a half feet wide. Must have gold around its its altar. Must have gold around the urn. Must have gold in this place and that place. And it must weigh this much. There was a, a, a direction that had to be followed. 
There was a sharpness to detail that almost everybody falls flat on. But there is a holy place for connection. But all I hear is that it was hard to get in and it was difficult to connect with. That's the first covenant. That's what first covenant worship looks like. And the joy for you and I is that we live in second covenant worship. And thanks be to Christ who does what the high priest cannot. Thanks be to Christ who looks upon all the regulations that we have to have to have connection and he says, let me be the one. Let me read this to you. Uh, Continuing on in Hebrews 9, it says this. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, hear me here, the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not made by creation itself, not made in a way that was particular, that was, had to be a certain way because we were the crafters of it, but made by creator himself. He entered once for all, into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats or calves or whatever the high priest would bring in there with him, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh... What he's saying in there, there's a long sentence. What he's saying is, if all these old offerings could be sprinkled on and we could make people able to worship through them, how much more, the next line says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I'm gonna stop there. There was a system in place, an ability to connect that only the high priest could enter into, not just the first veil, not just the first tent, not just the first curtain, but also into the second, to have an incomplete connection with the Father so that we could understand who he was. And Christ said, no, no, no. I will not have it be like that any longer. I will not have one person be commissioned for the sake of everybody be connecting. Instead, I will be one who comes into this space, offers himself for the connection of everyone so that we would all be commissioned into his service. There is beauty in this scripture. There is beauty power in the understanding that God looks upon tradition, looks upon something that was beautiful, and says there's more to it. Let me be the perfection in the midst of your imperfection. Let me be the atonement that you could not supply. Let me be the one who sheds his blood because the blood of goats and calves won't do the trick. Why? Because the most beautiful part of the scripture is this. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This was all about you being able to connect. Jesus looked upon this whole entire room in the moment on the cross. And he said, that person and this person and that person are gonna have these blockades consciously in their mind that keep them from me. It's gonna be a sin of the past. It's gonna be something that they're dwelling on. It's gonna be something that they're stepping into right now. It's gonna be a temptation that they have. It's gonna be an anger that they can't get rid of. It's gonna be a a, a vice, so to speak, in their own life. I don't want it to affect them. So let me not just sprinkle the blood of goats and calves. Let me sprinkle my own. And under my blood, no sin will have power. No temptation will conquer. No person will be held back. Their conscience will be clear so that I can be in relationship with them. That is the God we serve. And do you know what's so critical about this story? The veil tears in half at his atonement. 
The veil opens. The separation is no longer. The temple gates, the space in which only the holiest of thou could enter was now open to all of humanity. You, I, the broken, the widow, the hurt, the helpless, the homeless, the person that everybody was ostracizing was now open to enter the same space that the high priest was only allowed. The table that was only allowed to stand in the tent was now able to go wherever you reside. And so why table to table? It's because we understand this truth. The Old Testament was a story of people being commissioned to try and connect nations to God. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, David, prophet after prophet, commissioned to serve, speak on behalf of the Lord. The new covenant of God through Christ is different. He says, no, no, no. Let me be the connection. Let me be the bridge. Let me be the one who takes it all upon himself so that you and I can be in communion with the Father and let our connection with the Father commission us to the world. That's what we celebrate. That's why we gather. And it's why the table has to be seen as a priority. The table does not just reside in this space any longer. It resides wherever you find yourself. I want to close with this scripture from 1 Corinthians 11. And I'd like for you to close your eyes. It's from the message version. And it talks about coming to the Lord's table and understanding its power. It says this, So, my friends, when you come together to the Lord's table, be reverent and courteous with one another. If you're so hungry that you can't wait to be served, go home and get a sandwich. But by no means, don't risk turning this meal into an eating or drinking binge or a family squabble. Instead, see this place as important. It is a spiritual meal, a love feast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have invited us to the temple because you invite us to the table. And we sit at the table in so many spaces and maybe we just haven't purposed it yet. But Lord, we wanna know and we wanna reflect on the fact that you purposed the table when you were the high priest, when you were what we could not be, when you stepped into that space that, was, that you had to be so sharp to step into and said, I am done having one person speak for all and I am ready to be the one person who opens this world up for everybody else that the table no longer resides in the tent, but resides wherever we go. And I pray that we would find that table of connection with so many friends, with so many hobbies that we find ourselves in, in neighborhoods that we live in. Lord, that that table of connection would lead to a table of commission where we'd be commissioned into the world to serve you, to help others know who you are and to love one another deeply because connection leads to commissioning. Lord, you are good and you love us. You've shown it through your son. Your son showed it through the way in which the temple was transformed by the second covenant that you've made with us. And Lord, we stand on that promise today knowing that you will make it all clear for us. Clearing our conscience so that we can be connected with you. Enter into the holy of holies every time that we acknowledge your presence in our space and help others do the same. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. You stand, please.
That is the beauty of why we gather. We gather knowing that we will depart, hopefully into different mission fields, different spaces and different tables, one in which that departure should lead to an emotional pain because we love being corporately with one another. But it's not the whole pie. This is the icing on the cake. Church starts when you leave this space, when you're commissioned out into the world, knowing that we gather to be scattered knowing that we'll gather again, whether it's here or in eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for for your truth, for the way in which you show us new ways every single week and every single day, how you connect us to be commissioned and not the other way around. Lord, you've loved and created a bridge so that we would know the love of the Father and that that love would spur us to help others know. Lord, call us out of this space knowing that the tables we find ourselves in are tables of transformation, tables and spaces where the world can come in contact with your goodness and your light through us. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.